Mr. President, <clears throat> Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to warmly welcome you to the 37th session of the Industrial Development Board. Let me start by expressing my gratitude to the outgoing Bureau, and in particular to Ambassador Sonny Ogokwi of Nigeria, who chaired the 36th session of the Board. His commitment and leadership assured constructive and smooth conduct of that session. I wish to congratulate our new president, Ambassador Helmut Burke of Austria, as well as the new bureau on the election. I am confident that under your able leadership, Mr. President, we can be assured of a successful conclusion of our present session. I would also like to welcome Mr. Francis Gurry, Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, who has joined us for this session of the board and will take part in the UNIDO WIPO interactive session this afternoon. Our organizations have had a long relationship with common interests in areas such as technology transfer and the role of intellectual property in development. Mr. Gurry has been strongly supportive of this relationship throughout his career with WIPO, and we look forward to consolidating this further. In fact, the theme for this particular Industrial Development Board is technology transfer. So the next sessions in the next few days, we wanted to emphasize that through looking at agribusiness and some of our environmental fields. I can see from the agenda that you have an intensive and challenging work schedule ahead of you over the, the coming days. To facilitate your deliberations on these matters, the Secretariat has submitted a comprehensive set of documents. I will also refer to several of these agenda items in my statement this morning and leave my senior management to provide additional introductions and information as necessary when these items are taken up for consideration. <clears throat> Mr. President, distinguished delegates, this is the first occasion in my second term of office that I stand before you in this board. You probably know by now that I would like to use these opportunities to paint the broad brush strokes of what is going on around us. And that is what I propose to do today. The reason I do so is to bring closer to us all the reality that UNIDO's activities cannot be divorced from, the climate that surrounds us, be it economic, political, or environmental. We do not exist in a vacuum and must pay heed to evolving trends and the actions of others. I will return to these themes in a few moments recounting a number of the global challenges or mega trends that define the world in which we live in and how the UN system and UNIDO are equipped to respond to them. Allow me to begin, however, by referring to some important recent developments in UNIDO's household. A full review is presented in the annual report of our organization for 2009, which is on your agenda item this morning. This report should also be seen as providing an overview of UNIDO's achievements in the context of the Triennial Comprehensive Policy Review of Operational Activities for Development of the United Nations System, or the TCPR. Let me look at recent developments within UNIDO itself. My management has made bold projections about how UNIDO could increase its technical cooperation delivery while improving the quality of the services it provides. This growth with quality strategy is now the backbone of our organization. It is at the heart of our new mission statement and informs what we're doing in the change management process. And it seeks to optimize our contribution to global development aims, including the Millennium Development Goals. I am pleased to inform you that this increase in de delivery is still on track. In the first quarter of 2010, 
UNIDO delivered more than 56 million in technical cooperation, an increase of more than 14% over the corresponding figure of about 49 million US dollars for the same period last year. Likewise, the collection rate of assessed contributions show significant improvement. By the end of March, over 52% had been collected, compared to 47% in the first quarter of 2009. I am also pleased to announce that we now comply with the International Public Sector Accounting Standards, IPSAS, following the General Conference decision to adopt IPSAS, UNIDO moved to implement all essential system changes and put the standards in place as scheduled in January 2010. We are one of only eight, we are one of only eight organizations to have done so. Many others were forced to postpone their implementation dates by up to four years. We have also provided a report on the activities of the Joint Inspection Unit. As the report notes, we're making significant progress in implementing the JIU recommendations. Change management. This goes to show, the above goes to show that real changes can be delivered and they can be delivered on time. Let me provide you with an update on our program for change and organizational renewal. This has made considerable progress in addresses, addressing issues related to changing the organizational culture of UNIDO, introducing operational improvements, and preparing for the implementation of a new enterprise resource planning system. Over the coming weeks, we will carry out a high-level business process reengineering exercise, which will be closely linked to the development of a new business concept and is a prerequisite for the selection of appropriate ERP software and a suitable implementation partner. You will find detailed information on the progress to date, as well as planned actions in a conference room paper which has been made available. I would like to thank those member states who renounced their shares of the unutilized balances of appropriations. Thanks to your generous commitment, we have collected 5.3 million euros for change management and 1.5 million euros for technical cooperation trust funds on food security and renewable energy for productive activities, respectively. For change management, this leaves a shortfall of 3.8 million euros between the funds received and those approved by the General Conference in December. The amount available for the trust funds allows us to initiate development of relevant programs, but more will be needed. I would therefore strongly encourage member states to make further contributions for change management and the trust funds, thus enabling the organization to be fit for the future and achieve growth with quality. Our readiness to change is apparent in in other ways too. Let me give you some examples from developments in personnel matters, evaluation, and multilingualism. After intensive staff management consultations, we have now finalized our new human resource management framework. This revision became necessary due to a number of organizational and human resource developments since the last version was issued in 2001 to 2003. I am confident that this new framework will increase the wherewithal of our organization to attract new talent while fortifying the emphasis on knowledge management, as well as further supporting a results-based management culture. A document has been provided to member states giving a comprehensive review of our recent HRM management actions including measures to enhance knowledge transfer and knowledge management and promote, and promote cultural change in the framework of the change management process. You will also see before you today a note on the activities of the evaluation group. 
evaluation is our main tool for diagnosing how we can improve what we do. Unido's evaluation function was recently subject to a, of a peer review conducted by the representatives of evaluation units of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, the Austrian Development Agency, the CTBTO, and the World Bank. The review found that UNIDO's evaluation function meets the UN DAC norms and standards related to the three criteria used for the assessment, namely independence, credibility, and utility. It found further that the evaluation group is clearly established as a driving force for organizational learning and change. In addition, the panel made useful recommendations for further strengthening of our evaluation function, and we are acting on those recommendations. We have taken great strides towards achieving multilingualism. Our website and key internal administrative documents are available in both working languages, and we have increased the use of official languages in other materials, including UNIDO's new magazine, Making It. One month ago, UNIDO successfully hosted back-to-back -back meetings of the UN Development Group at, at the principal's level and the UN System Chief Executive's Board for Coordination, or the CEB. The CEB meeting in Vienna brought together the heads of 27 UN system organizations under the chairmanship of the Secretary General to discuss issues affecting the activities of the entire UN family, ranging from climate to global governance and achieving the MDGs. This was the first time in the history of UNIDO that we hosted the CEB, and it is a mark of our commitment to advancing greater coherence and coordination within the UN system. We have also been seeking ways to further strengthen our collaboration with agencies with comparable and complementary mandates. Last week, we hosted a delegation from the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, to discuss areas in which we can work together. I would also like to draw your attention to the draft agreement between UNIDO and WIPO, which has been put before the, this board for approval. This agreement provides a solid framework within which both organizations can seek synergies in their development activities. Similar programmatic cooperation will be pursued with UNDP, IFAD, UNEP, and other members of the UN Development Group. Let me say a few words about our recently expired cooperation agreement with UNDP, which has now definitely come to an end and does not and will not be renewed. In many ways, the agreement was ahead of its time in providing an innovative and collaborative approach to shared field operations and joint activities. In particular, it led to the establishment of 17 UNIDO desks in established UN country offices, thereby expanding our field presence and capacity. In more than half of the countries with UNIDO desks, the heads of UNIDO operations assigned to these desks have been admitted to the United Nations country teams. In light with the joint terminal evaluation, we are currently reviewing the possibilities for further enhancing the effectiveness of the UNIDO desks established under the agreement. In an in-depth analysis of our field network, an in-depth analysis of the impact of our field network will be presented at the next session of the board. In this connection, I would like to assure you, however, that I will continue to place great emphasis on strengthening our field presence, and in particular, the substantive capacities of our field offices, and that in cases clearly calling for an expanded presence, decisions will be taken immediately. Where appropriate, we will also continue to cooperate with UNDP in areas of mutual in interest, both bilaterally and in the context of UN system-wide coherence within the mandate given by the TCPR. 
That concludes some of the housekeeping issues I wanted to bring for your attention. And now I shift to the global trends and what we see in the development field. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, let me turn to the broader picture, the global mega trends. You will see up in the graphics that I use, that I used in the general conference last December, these mega trends. I would like to take you through this again. None of the trends is any less relevant now, five months on. They still exist. And this forms the perspective that I have about UNIDO's role in the next three and a half years under my leadership and our interaction with the UN system. None of these are new. You see that the food, fuel, and financial crisis still exists. We feel the impact even today, everywhere. We continue to be concerned about the vulnerability of economies. Despite the recent drop in oil prices that we saw from 150, prices are still going up. $83 per barrel, sometimes 90. We worry within the system that this will still continue to grow. And so the impact of the three Fs will still be on poor countries. I want to spend time on the demographics. The number of people in this world grew more rapidly in the last six and a half decades than ever before. The latest prediction is for the world's population to reach 9 billion by 2050. 95% of the annual increase in world population occurs in developing countries. This would put major challenges on job creation, on youth employment, political stability in these countries, and of course, gender economic empowerment. To create these new jobs for such massive populations, you need industrialization. There's no other way. Agriculture alone will not do it. The people in these developing countries are voting with their feet. They're leaving the rural areas and heading for the cities. So structural transformation, industrialization, is one of the key ways to do it. This is the recent example in the last 50 years in China, in India, in Malaysia, in Brazil, and in other places. Industrialization is one of the key answers. That is the reality of the world. I mentioned the illicit economy, but you've heard a lot of that from the UNODC, and I know you'll be having a, a session, I think after the IDB on criminal, what is it, criminal justice or something. Some ambassadors have told me already that in the next few weeks you'll be dealing with the illicit economy. If you don't have jobs in crowded cities, the mafia takes over. Again, job creation, structural change, key to making sure that we have populations of productive citizens and nations are not taken over by criminal elements. Climate change. When we met at the General Conference in December, negotiations about, were about to begin in Copenhagen. You remember I had a number of African heads of states here and the chairperson of the African Union, along with many, many ministers from around the world. Some of them left here to go to Copenhagen. Although an accord was reached, it was not what many of us had hoped for. How we face up to climate change is still the defining issue of our time. Along with the impacts of the economic crisis, it has major repercussions for the role of the United Nations system and global governance generally. I'll talk about that some more later on, but we are preparing now for Cancun. In New York last week, we had several sessions with some people in the Secretary General's Cabinet about Con Cancun, and obviously later on South Africa. Given my role in UN Energy, we are required to provide key inputs. The other trend we see is green growth and green industry. The fundamental challenge in combating climate change is how to decouple the consumption of natural resources and the emissions of greenhouses from economic growth. That's the challenge we face. Can we still grow economies without increasing emissions? Can we still grow economies and then reduce the energy intensi intensity of our GDP? Green industry remains the way forward. 
UNIDO has been an advocate for this for, for some time now, and I'm pleased to say that the concept has gained some wings, in part because of some major events that we organize, for example, the International Conference on Green Industry in Manila last September, and the Global Renewable Energy Forum in Mexico last October, as well as due to our guiding role in UN Energy and the Secretary General's Advisory Group on Energy and Climate Change, and also the Vienna Energy Conference we hosted. But this is a central part of UNEDO's mandate. This is a central part of UNEDO's mandate. And we see it all around the world. During the Swedish presidency of the EU, the theme was eco-efficiency. It's the same idea, reducing resource intensity of production, making sure we take care of ecosystems as we grow, but also the technologies that are needed for this green, new green growth. We see the same with South Korea, China, and India leading the way, and also Brazil in a number of green industry initiatives. But the same is applying in North America as well. This is a core part of UNIDO mandate. In widely reported recent comments, World Bank President Robert Zelek sees the ongoing global financial crisis as spelling the end of many long-standing paradigms of the global economy and development, including terminologies like the third wall and North south. According to Bob Zelek, globalization has come of age. Indeed, we now live in a multipolar world where some developing countries are emerging as economic powers and others are growing strongly. Yet, in the continued absence of a conclusion to the Doha round of multilateral trade negotiations, some are still struggling to reach the, their potential. Part of what Bob Zelek reported to the spring meeting of the World Bank is that, in fact, the economic recovery we enjoy now is because Asia is growing. So it is great that other developing countries that were, in fact, poor countries before are growing. So when we have crisis in the OECD countries, their growth is helping to balance out. But he proposes that perhaps, that's why he calls it the end of the third world. He says, perhaps, it is in our vested interest, therefore, to make more poor nations modern and growing fast. Maybe we prevent the next crisis, because there will be many centers of gravity for economic development. The poor countries today may be generating the new demand. We need to make the whole world prosperous. This was one key lesson he was emphasizing in the bank meetings, that it is the reality today that when we help others develop fast and they grow, the rest of the world benefits as well. So we hope, again, this whole issue of structural change, which we emphasized in our last industrial development report, becomes again an issue that is, that is recognized as part of our work within UNIDO. Let me spend a little bit of time on global governance. With all of this and climate change, there is a major global governance debate going on. We discussed it with the Secretary General here in Vienna during the CEB. In fact, end of May, there will be a report being launched in Doha, Qatar, on what they call the Global Reengineering Initiative from the World Economic Forum. They were just testing it in Tanzania last week at the World Economic Forum. Basically, the World Economic Forum asked Mr. Malok Brown and a team of others to interview uh, chief executives that typically go to the World Economic Forum and, and leaders. As you know, that's where everybody shows up, those who manage the world. And they believe we need to look at global governance very closely. Climate change and other challenges and the financial cri crisis has led to the emergence of informal multilateralism. G20 is not a legal entity, but it was created quickly to deal with the financial crisis. And guess what? It worked. It slowed down the spread of the financial crisis. It made sure that now we're beginning to recover. But yes, it was not a legal entity. We also saw the emergence of the major economies forum to deal with climate change. Within that, just before Copenhagen, we saw the birth of a new group as well, BASIC. These are realities today. Along with the United Nations and the other legally established institutions, 
you have new groupings of countries to deal with global crisis. Question for you, the diplomats and scholars of international relations. Is this the future trend? How will this connect to the legal institutions that you established back in 1948 or 1950s, the UN and others? How will they complement the role? But how do we make them inclusive? They're good groups, they're arresting problems, but not everybody is present. So how do we align them with, in fact, the United Nations? This is part of the debate in New York. This is the debate that is going around. Where is the UN in all of this? Have the UN system and other formal intergover intergovernmental agencies lost relevance? Perhaps you think I'm being too provocative, but while we need to work with others in reaching our common goals, I firmly believe in the underlying principles of the United Nations and its structure as a common forum for all of humanity, small, big, poor, rich. That was the basis of the United Nations. So as we evolve new mechanisms, it is our challenge to see how they in fact become inclusive and all voices, especially the voices of the voiceless, are also heard. The United Nations and its agencies simply must advocate for the areas which they operate, must encourage new learning, and must put solutions into practice through technical cooperation and normative activities. Not to do so would be to neglect our mandate, and above all, would be negligent to, to the needs of those we serve. Let me turn to UNIDO in this context. We are an integral member of the UN system, as well as a specialized agency in our own right. That means we have a certain expertise that we bring to technical activities for industrial development. It also means that across the areas of our mandate, we are thought leaders and catalysts for change within the UN system. This whole question of the relevance of the UN, I see it also going on even in development agencies that I have had the privilege to visit in the last four months. In fact, last week in Washington, I was invited to a closed meeting looking at USAID and their own relevance to MDGs. The key challenge we all face, whether it's multilateral or bilateral agencies, is that at the country level, what quality advice can we give to governments? that are facing convergence of mega trends. We in the UN, we've been trained to stick to our mandate. We stick to our mandate, so like a tunnel vision. But the countries are facing multiple factors affecting them. It is the same problem in the bilateral development agencies. I know, because they're debating it. So the question is, what is the quality of the advice? In some agencies that prefer humanitarian work, they see the real solution is just education and health. Not true. As you promote education and health, the economy must grow because the demographics are happening faster. As you promote education and health, the, the revenue base of the government must increase if they're going to finance these services when donor money leaves. In fact, one of the key debates, the countries that are doing well, for example, in Africa, Uganda, Ghana, and others, they're all still hooked to budget support. In some cases, 48%, 60% of the budgets depend on donors. In, in my country, Sierra Leone, probably 70%. You cannot say then, industrialization, economic transformation, and rapid growth is not relevant. If you advise governments that way, you're not looking at their reality. As their cities grow and their democracies become fragile and drug dealers take over, as is happening in West Africa. So the kind of advice, and this is a real debate, we spend time here in Vienna with the Secretary General discussing it. Can our representatives on the ground give relevant advice now to poor countries or emerging economies? To move into green economies, to grow their economies while at the same time investing in social development. If they are narrow-minded, they're totally irrelevant. The UN will become irrelevant. So this multidisciplinary nature is crucial and it will continue to challenge UNIDO as well. This is why we believe in the coherence. This is why we believe in the partnership with other agencies. Activities such as these I have mentioned have also enabled UNIDO to initiate and refine our own strategies 
and framework in support of sustainable development, such as the Plan of Action for the Least Developed Countries, adopted in 2009 ministerial meeting and endorsed by the General Conference, as well as our Green Industry Init Initiative and approach to agro-industries. Let me illustrate this by presenting just four of the many methods through which you need to support sustainable development. Green industry, energy, agribusiness, and technology. Take green industry, for example. Our meeting in Manila last year not only led Asian governments to commit themselves to establish policies and frameworks conducive to resource efficient and low carbon industries and to intensify international cooperation in these issues, it also provided the basis for UNIDO's Green Industry Initiative, through which we can assist government to remove gaps in their normative frameworks, support systems, knowledge, and skills. Likewise, our leadership in energy issues is largely down to our convening advisory roles, and not because of the volume of our technical cooperation. I should emphasize this. When we decided to take the leadership of UN Energy or the advisory group, it is not because UNIDO is a big player in energy. No. Our, our technical cooperation in this field is less than 10 million. The World Bank invests 4 billion. That's not the issue. The issue is ideas, catalytic ideas. Can we challenge the global development system to recognize the link between energy access and growth? Can we challenge the global system to recognize that 60% of greenhouse gas emissions come from energy-related activities in transport buildings and power generation? That if you're going to deal with climate change, you must deal with power, access to energy, and energy efficiency. UNIDO is not a big player, but UNIDO is a thought leader. In fact, our report last week in New York was very well received. We will share with you the many coverage in New York Times and other newspapers, in other news outlets in India, China, and other places that just picked it up. Because we, UNIDO, myself and others, decided to play a catalytic role. Why? Because without a cheap, reliable energy source, you cannot industrialize. You cannot. Can you say then, UNIDO should not be involved in energy? then you don't know the reality of India, China, Sierra Leone, or for that matter, the EU, where there's a lot of emphasis on transition to renewable energy systems. But it is the transformative opportunities for new technology, new skills, new growth. So every region, EU, North America, poor countries, we all care about energy. You need or can be a thought leader. This is why you created this organization, not just technical cooperation on the ground. That is necessary, but also reflecting the reality and the new ideas we need. I'm grateful you allowed me to do that leadership. When I started, some people said, oh, Yumkela is shifting too much to climate change. I was not shifting to climate change. I was addressing a reality three years ago, and I thank God that I did, because that's the central issue today. The Secretary General has agreed in fact, requested me to continue for another year with the advisory group. I will continue two more years with the energy group. We launched the report. We plan to launch it here in Vienna on the 19th of May. We will launch it also in Japan. We will launch it in Rome. Why Rome? FAO and IFAD have asked us to launch the report there because they are developing a model of an integrated energy and food and water systems very obvious, if you don't have a reliable power supply in the rural areas, as I will demonstrate, as we've seen in, in other countries, you cannot help these women reduce their burden of going down to collect firewood, coming back, putting that down, maybe after four kilometers, going back to collect water before they start cooking, or to store their food before they take it to market, or to process it more efficiently. We give you some examples of our projects. In Rwanda, for example, we started a, a hydro project there, a small hydro project. Today, Uganda is trying to do 10 of these on their own. We inaugurate two of these hydro projects, simple projects providing 200 kilowatts of energy. But that's the first time those communities have a power source instead of using fuel wood, just using the streams they have. 
We give you another example here from Cuba. This I visited. That's the Swiss ambassador there with me. This is a project simple, using waste in the garbage dumps to generate electricity for the community. But what is significant here? We trained over 1,000 people, over 1,000 people in the chain, because people have to sort out the garbage. They need collection points. They need a new simple technology to generate methane from the garbage. They also need to collect the waste from that process, the byproduct, to also use as fertilizer. But the municipalities have picked it up. Projects like these need to be scaled. You're converting waste to energy. These are simple projects. Now, there was a negative side to this. When we were visiting this site, right there, next door to us, there was a very bad project funded by a bilateral agency. What were they doing? They were teaching the Cubans to punch holes in the garbage and burn the methane, releasing CO2 instead of methane. But the company was getting carbon credits. That's the easy way to do it, but it's the bad way to do it. The best way is to show them how to use it to enhance their energy access, not to burn. The argument is, well, methane is more earthwarming than CO2, but it is still a, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. That's the easy way. The best way is to go the next step. Can you pipe that gas into homes, into factories, so you enhance their productivity? We hope we can scale this up. We thank the Swiss government for their support. This took us a couple of years, but it is ready for scale up in other places. I also visited India this February. And yes, we did not only stay in Delhi, we went to Bangalore and to Coimbatore. Ambassador knows that Coimbatore is quite a distance. But I do that to get a feel for real technologies on the ground. Here, we're using a gasifier technology developed locally in India by one of their scientific institutions. Si similar concept. You take waste biomass that they have to burn anyway. You gasify it and increase its energy content so that you can generate electricity or generate heat for bakeries. This is commercialized already simple. We've taken a simple one of this, just for 100 kilowatts. We're testing it in Africa. A lot of these technologies exist, but it is using energy for productive use. That's the key. That's where we fit in, and the technology transfer related to it. I don't have an, the other picture I wanted to show, but in addition to this, I did go to Norway, to, to Stavanger. I flew out to the oil platform, the Slipner oil platform. It is one of the newest and most high-tech platforms around the world. What is it doing? It's experimenting with carbon capture and storage. So I go from high-tech to low-tech. It's all about technology transfer. Carbon capture and storage is emerging as one of the key solutions. And we, UNIDO, we've received funding now from Norway and from Australia to see if this technology can be applied to industry. In other words, we know we are going to be dependent on fossil fuels even up to 2050. Can we decarbonize it? Can we reduce the emissions that are coming out so that, yes, industry and others can use these energies? So, yes, indeed, we go from low-tech to high-tech. Energy pro projects such as these aim to increase productive capacities and guard against poverty, but action on a global scale will be needed. The report we launched in New York also links energy with climate change. We will be hosting our next meeting for the advisory group on energy, in fact, in, uh, in Mexico in a few months, hosted by Carlos Slim. The productive sectors remain indispensable to achieving the MDGs, and we will take this message to New York in September. In order to provide you with a full report on UNIDO's continuing contributions to the MDGs in the wake of the summit, including our support to the pharmaceutical sectors and cooperation with international partner organizations, I have proposed that this be taken up as a supplementary item at the 38th session of the Industrial Development Board. Tomorrow you'll be looking at agro-industries. So I will not say much about that here. We will cover that uh, tomorrow. But basically, we, we are firmly behind supporting agro-businesses and agro-industries because, yes, still most of the poor live in rural areas, but they are moving to the city. They still have to be fed we still need jobs. And all the studies we know from the World Bank and others show that if we attack agriculture properly, we will be able to attack poverty at the same time. 
and meet MDG1, reducing hunger and reducing poverty. But we emphasize value addition. This is why we partnered with, with um, IFAT, FAO, the African Development Bank, and, and the African Union and several institutions to do the conference in Nigeria. But I give you the graphic here. For UNIDO, green industry, agribusiness, technology, energy. These will be central to what we do in the next three and a half years under my leadership. They are not mutually exclusive. They are together. No, none of those is more important than the other. Collectively, we need all. On agribusiness, we thank very much the leadership of India, Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, and others who have made us focus on this topic as a key towards poverty reduction, job creation, and agro-industries-led industrialization. We will continue that work. I have mentioned what we're going to do with WIPO and ITU in the next uh, uh, few, uh, few, few years. We, we are also in discussions with WHO and others who have approached us on looking at do, uh, local uh, access to medication as a way of meeting some of the MDGs on health. Now, I, I emphasize, we have been asked. I didn't go and ask them for partnership. They are asking for partnership, but we continue to look at this. Here, I want to express our deep gratitude to the government of Germany. They highlighted this issue with us four years ago and have provided significant funding over three years to do the analysis that will influence whatever partnership we will define with WHO. We will show you a short video, but I would rather we show the video after my speech, on our cooperation with Hewlett-Packard. It, it is similar to a cooperation we have with uh, uh, Microsoft. Here you will see again technology transfer at the core of that intervention, but related to entrepreneurship, agribusiness as an integrated part. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my speech was long, but it is the first one in my second term as your Director General. I have given you an indication of what the House looks like today. I thank you for your continued support. I have given you an indication. The new context where we work. As an industry agency, we must remain sharp. Therefore, all of UNIDO's mandates within its constitution, its convening role, its normative role, its technical cooperation role, are all relevant here. Some people wonder, well, why did he do so many conferences his first term? Because I needed to position UNIDO as an intellectual agency, as an, as an agency that is looking ahead and looking at trends to advise properly governments. And all the events we did were fully backed by various governments. I needed to do that. We have frameworks now. Now it's time to deliver on the programs. But we have to continue that role. The world is changing. Industry is facing challenges they didn't see before, but there are many opportunities. To capture those opportunities, we must remain sharp. One of the areas where you will see real significant discussion and global forum is industrial policy. For 20 years, we were scared of touching industrial policy, even using the word industrial policy, because the Washington consensus convinced the world that industrial policy is irrelevant, that the markets will decide, the financial crisis proved everybody wrong. We don't believe we wait for another financial crisis. We already have requests from countries as they're looking at diversification strategies, as they're looking ahead. We'll give you an article published from Harvard University by Danny Roderick about the role of industrial policy today, but we know similar debates are taking place in a number of countries. It is not the old style industrial policy of the 1960s or 70s where government decides the policy and begins to create the factories. No. It is a new version of industrial policy that is private sector led, but in partnership with governments to create opportunities, particularly for green growth. And one of the issues that Danny Roddick quotes in this example is that in the United States, one of the biggest opponents to industrial policy, the US is also the biggest user of industrial policy. This is from Harvard. This is not from Jung Keller. And one of the new areas where it is used is in green industry, green energy systems. If you don't have a state providing incentives, financing R&D, we will not be able to achieve green growth because the markets are risky. The public sector has to give incentives. 
And I know, for example, when you look at a basic incentive like a feed-in tariff, it has a big impact on renewable energies. So this is the new industrial policy. We will be dealing with that. I know a number of governments are looking at their manufacturing sector. I know from my visits, I see one or two people nodding because they did discuss it with me. Major economies are looking at this. This new industrial policy that creates an opportunity for green growth, job creation and wealth creation at the same time because the demographic pressures are real. Thank you very much.